Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Welcome to the Labor Day edition of our weekly Torah study. The Sedra this week is Ki Teitze. We'll be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. Several weeks ago, we paused our studies briefly to take note of the human evil connected then and now probably forever with that wonderful community of Charlottesville, Virginia. The language, the confrontations, the images, the rage, the death, the terror that the Nazis and the alt-right and the white supremacists brought not just to Charlottesville but to our entire country are etched deeply and permanently into our minds. And today, with the dawning of the month of September, and with the high holidays approaching with what is beginning to feel like warp speed, we have Harvey, probably the most devastating natural event ever to hit our country. Again, death and terror and the images, the images of tens of tens of thousands of refugees, one that grabbed me, of residents in a nursing home sitting in their wheelchairs, unable to move with the water rising to their chest, waiting, hoping, praying for rescuers to arrive. And in this particular case, they in fact did arrive in time. People stranded on rooftops, streets that have become raging rivers, sweeping away all that was encountered. So much has been lost. So many have died. So much unexpected suffering will now shape the lives literally of millions and the incredible number of civilian volunteers who joined the police and the National Guard and the Army and the Coast Guard and the Navy volunteers from all across the country putting their humanity to work without any thought of reward or recognition. That was beauty in the midst of hell. Job long ago taught us that we human beings have absolutely no idea we're clueless about the nature of the workings of the universe. But as the sun returns to Texas and hopefully soon to Louisiana as well, the light of goodness shining from those individual acts of people just caring for people will forever be remembered. We pray for all of the victims of Harvey. And after praying, we in fact are called upon to undertake acts of loving kindness to reach out to those in need to make their lives if possible just a little bit easier okay to our text according to our tradition we all know this by now there are 613 meets vote 365 negative 245 positive that thou shalt not send the thou shalt and we are expected to do as many of them as we possibly can. And the rabbis, as an act of total kindness, elaborated upon the 613, giving us thousands of additional mitzvot, adding to the core list, as Judaism, in fact, evolved from the biblical era to the modern era to, to our own times. Each of those mitzvot, we are taught, reflects the will of God. We are warned not to pick or choose. Among them, we can prioritize, but only in the case of an emergency. For example, in order to save a human life, we can, in fact, we must violate Shabbat. But that's the exception. But let me share a little secret with you. There is a mitzvah in this week's sedra that the rabbis quietly, privately noted was the very least of all of the mitzvot. Deuteronomy 22.6, check it out. If you come upon a bird's nest and the mother is sitting upon her eggs and you need to gather those eggs for food, then do not take the mother with the eggs, drive her away, and then take the eggs. And you will be rewarded with long life, a tiny act of kindness. I can't tell the entire story here, but some 2,000 years ago, one of the greatest of all of Jewish teachers, Rabbi Elisha ben Abuya, was literally driven from his faith when he observed someone trying to follow this least of all mitzvot and who died in the act. Elisha ben Abuya was outraged and abandoned his faith. If you've never read As a Driven Leaf, the book name As a Driven Leaf, do yourselves a favor. 
read the entire story there. It's, it's absolutely a treat. But in the same sedra as this least of all of the mitzvot is to be found, so do we found one of the most, find one of the most consequential of all the mitzvot, that dealing with divorce. Found Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4 in our sedra. All that the Torah has to say about divorce is found in these four verses. Frustrating? You better believe it. The scene is set. Here's the quote. A man takes a woman to be his wife. All right, that was the system. And she fails to please him because she finds ervatavar, something obnoxious. He finds something obnoxious about her. What does that mean? This is the only statement in the Torah that sets the grounds for divorce. And it just isn't clear. Obnoxious. Ervatavar. What's that? Huge sections of the Talmud are then devoted to try to figure out what that means. Is it some grievous sexual misbehavior on her part? Or perhaps it is simply that she burned his dinner. Or maybe he found someone more attractive than she is literally. Those are the options available. Though we are taught over and over again that Torah, aura, Torah is light. In this case, all we get is darkness. In this critical matter, there is an unpleasant lack of clarity. Okay, so we don't know what the grounds of divorce are, but let's read on. And he writes her a bill of divorcement hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. The Hebrew for bill of divorcement, what is the word? Get. We know the word get. A get is the legal document given by a man to a woman according to the halakha that allows her then to remarry. So the husband gives her a get. Oh, but what's a get? Where is it to find? Where is it described? Nowhere in the Torah. Again, there are lengthy discussions in the Talmud that try to describe exactly what a get should be. How many lines? What language? How is it handed to her? Could an agent be involved in handing it to her? Uh, but the Torah text doesn't help us at all here. It seems that the only clarity in these four verses is to be found in the very last verse. And what is that clarity? He hands her a get. She goes out and gets remarried, and for whatever reason, her husband dies or they're divorced, she may not remarry her original husband. The whole point of those three, four verses is to deal with that very last verse, how not to enter a forbidden remarriage. Everything else was secondary, at least according to the author. The grounds for divorce in the Torah, unclear. The text of the divorce document in the Torah, unclear. All that is really clear is that the active agent here is the man, and that's a pity. Even as I believe that a couple, whatever the genders, should have a religious document, a ketubah, that reflects the moral, ethical, religious basis for a marriage. So do I believe that a couple that is divorcing, should share a document that dissolves their union with clear concern for religious, moral, and ethical standards. Now, the rabbis worked out all of the missing details some 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, and those details reflect the behavioral standards of 1,500 or 2,000 years ago. Fine. It's not in the Torah, so the rabbis did what they felt to be logical and appropriate for their day. But so much of what they created in this matter is, in my eyes, patently offensive. In the simplest of terms, a marriage entered into in the 21st century is understood to be a relationship entered into freely by two equal adults. And a divorce in our day should be no different. The old system has created a community of permanently chained women, agunot, 
chained women who cannot reestablish their lives because their husband, the only active agent, refuses to issue a get. A summary. The system of fundamentally empowering men over women cannot just be tinkered with. It needs to be replaced. The system of making a marriage into a prison for the woman cannot just be tinkered with. It needs to be replaced. We are not talking about sparing a mother bird's feelings here. We are talking about establishing justice in the most fundamental building blocks of human society. If only the author of this chapter had read what he himself had written in last week's Sedra, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. Justice. My friends, pray for our fellow human beings in Texas and in Louisiana and then act to help make their lives somehow just a little bit easier. And then remember, based upon our text study of divorce, that the pursuit of justice begins at home in the most personal of settings. Well, that's it. Shabbat Shalom. Have a great Shabbat and a great coming week. And after you've Listen to all this and study this. Hit share. Bring some other people into the conversation. I'll see you next week. Thank you.